Today, I'm detailing the process of replacing the electrolytic capacitors and the on-off switch in a Game Boy Advance. This GBA has featured in repair-related content on this channel several times before. I first pulled it apart four years ago because it wasn't turning on when I bought it. Old batteries had leaked everywhere, causing shorts and who knows what else. Luckily, this was an easy repair, as it sprung back to life after a thorough cleaning with vinegar and isopropyl alcohol. I didn't use it much after the repair, and recently, wanting to test a flash cart I was reviewing, I discovered it was again not operating. This was annoying, as it had just been a display piece since the original repair. And no, it wasn't stored with batteries inside. Several weeks ago, I uploaded an episode of Sunday Quickie where I diagnosed the fault. Check that out if you're into more casual, long-form content, but to summarise, capacitors had leaked and seemingly destroyed the on-off switch. This makes sense, since it was stored upright. The electrolytic fluid would have likely oozed right into it. Let's rewind the footage for disassembly, however. Seven screws are holding the case together. Six are tri-wing, while the last is a standard Philip head within the battery compartment. Tri-wing screwdrivers are very cheap and easy to find online if you don't own one. Be aware that the power switch, triggers and side panels are held in with gravity as you pull the case apart. The main board is attached to the screen with a ribbon cable. Flick up the tabs to release it from the connector. There shouldn't be any resistance. If there is, double check the tabs have been unlatched enough so you don't damage either the cable or the connector. Lastly, there will be a selection of screws holding the main board to the front half of the case. This apparently varies by model, but only one survives within mine. Here are the replacement parts. These were purchased from an online store called Yesterday's Tech, which appears to be based in Adelaide, Australia. This ensured there was quick postage from there to me, one stayed over in Western Australia. I should mention that this video was not sponsored by them and that I paid for the parts, although a sponsorship would be nice. I like money. As a quick review of Yesterday's Tech, the postage was prompt, the packaging was appropriate, and the product was as described. My personal experience was good, and I would consider them if you're based in Australia. I was surprised the switch was shipped in two pieces. This appears to be on purpose. This cost $8, which is cheaper than what I could find on eBay. The capacitor kit was also $8, again, fairly priced, and also included an inductor. I won't replace that unless I need to, as I've rarely had them fail. You can see the capacitors will be replacing. Three on the right, and one on the left. These are surface mounted capacitors, so the process to replace them is a bit different than what you might be used to. It's quite difficult to desolder them as is, but the capacitor can be safely twisted off its mount. You don't need to worry about ripping up any pads, since they're under the plastic. This capacitor didn't remove particularly cleanly, but you'll see what it should look like for the others. With that removed, the mount should easily lift up, since they don't appear to be adhered to the board. It doesn't really show on camera, but I could see leakage. All that remains of the capacitors are the legs on the solder pads. After cleaning up the leakage with IPA, I added fresh solder and removed the leg remnants while the solder was molten. I then whipped up the solder so the new capacitor could be mounted flush and gave the pads another clean. Soldering the new capacitor is easy since it sits flush, but the process can be a bit cramped. Holding it in place, solder one of the pads to anchor it in position, followed by the other to finish off. You don't need to use much solder to achieve this. But did you catch my mistake? Yeah, I totally installed the wrong capacitor like a dweeb. I noticed that it seemed small, but I figured this was down to it being a much newer part. So, moving on, I annoyingly desoldered it and gave it another crack. Capacitor number two twisted off much more like I had envisioned. From there, it was the same process. Remove the legs, clean, and add the new capacitor. Capacitor number three also went as planned. I forgot to film the removal process of the fourth from overhead, so here it is from the desk cam. Remembering to turn the camera on, we can see this whole section of the board needs a clean, not just under the capacitor. The potentiometer and headphone jack were looking particularly crusty. With the capacitors replaced, I moved my attention to the switch. It's attached to the board with minimal solder, so I added and reflowed the sides to aid in the desoldering process. There was even less solder on the four pads around the back. I added flux paste this time around, which was my first time using it. This is way better than the pens I was using previously. It's a lot more precise. Thanks to that, desoldering was quite easy. Although I probably was premature in ripping it off at this point. I should have loosened it a bit more first. But fortunately, I didn't rip up any pads. After a clean, I soldered on the mounting board, which aligns with the pads. Like with the capacitors, I anchored it into position before soldering the rest. 
I added a bit more solder to the sides than usual. This is because the switch is a physical point of failure from flicking the toggle back and forth. Hopefully, doing this will secure it more in the long term. I then soldered the switch to the mounting board. I still don't understand why it doesn't come pre-attached. My only guess is that the parts were sourced from two different places. Again, this is the same routine. Align, anchor, and fill in the rest. I also checked the connections with a multimeter. And that's it. I finally finished up the roll of solder I purchased when I got into electronics all those years ago. Bittersweet, really. But there's no time for emotion. Let's give the board a final courtesy clean and partially reassemble the unit for a test. The power LED lit up and there was sound, but the screen was completely blank. Hoping this was just something simple like the ribbon cable not being seated properly, I pulled the handheld apart and reseated it. Thankfully, that was indeed the issue. My GBA is working again. Let's test a cartridge and make sure it boots. This is the bootleg flash cartridge I covered in a previous video. I didn't even realise the GBA was faulty until I started testing it. Either way, it boots, but there are currently no buttons for further testing. So let's completely reassemble the unit and hopefully wrap this up. Nice. We're a go. Although to be honest, the switch isn't the greatest. The toggle isn't as large as the original, so the plastic piece used to switch it back and forth feels a bit iffy. Although I might print something to help it at a later date if it becomes an issue. Now it can go back on my display shelf, probably not to be touched again for another four years. What problems will await me then?